uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on telecom disputes. I'm Rafael Carmona and from the AAAI CDR, I'm a director there and I uh, help with our young practitioners group, as you know, the ICDR Young and International. So uh, before we begin the webinar, I just want to take a moment of your time to remind you that you can join us an ICDR YNI associate. If you Google us, ICDR Young and International, you will find our website. And there you'll find registration forms in English and in Spanish, and also the recordings of all of our previous webinars. We also have a LinkedIn group called also ICDR Young and International, so you can request to join there and we'll be posting all of our updates there. Uh, with that, uh, also I want to thank everyone for joining this webinar today. I want to thank the panelists and the moderators who are also the organizers and the main force behind this webinar, uh, Hong and Laura. And without further ado, um, again, Hong, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafa, and welcome again to our webinar on the telecom sector, which is a sector of growing importance given the prevalence of the use of mobile wireless and satellite technology today. Laura is a senior counsel in Holland and Knight based in Mexico City, and I'm an associate at Three Crowns based in Washington, DC, and will be the moderators for today. We're also on the board of ICDR Young and International Group. So if you have any ideas for future programming or feedback after this session, please do feel free to reach out to us. Today, we're excited to be joined by a distinguished panel of experts and I'll hand the mic over to Laura to briefly introduce them. Thank you very much, Hong, and also welcome from my side to everyone. So we have two great experts with us today. Catalina unfortunately could not join. She had unexpected travel plans that made it impossible for her to be here. But we will we will miss her, but we, we are covered well with the experts we do have here. So we have Blanca Luevano, who leads the legal regulatory direction at AT&T in Mexico, where she provides legal analysis and verifies compliance with all applicable industry regulations. She maintains close contact with the Mexican telecommunications regulator and the consumer protection agency and analyzes antitrust regulations and provides internal regulatory advice to all areas around the company. And Chris is a senior managing director at NIRA and a leading authority in complex litigation disputes and competition matters. He's also the chair of NIRA's global energy environment communications and infrastructure practice where he leads over 100 experts in the areas of energy, communications, media, internet, environment, auctions, transport, and water. Gar ranks him among the world's leading commercial arbitration experts, and he serves on NIRA's board of directors, the board of directors of the International, Te International Telecommunications Society, and on the editorial board of telecommunications policy, amongst others. And I have had the pleasure in the past to work with both Blanca and Chris, and actually, they taught me most of what I know today about the telecom sector. So I'm particularly honored and happy to have them here with us today. Um, we will talk about the, the sector generally and provide an overview of the telecom sector and then go into the disputes during the second half of the webinar. So we will start with Chris. Could you maybe provide us with an overview of the sector? Who are the key players? What are the key issues? Yes. Thank you. Uh... Hi, everybody. Chris Stepan from NERA. So maybe start first with an overview of the sector so you can sort of understand where we're coming from. And once we're discussing the dispute, so it makes a bit, hopefully a bit more sense. In, in general terms, let's think about three different types of networks. We're thinking about the fixed line network, the mobile wireless network, and the satellite network. The fixed line is the one that you know with the rights um, voice. It provides broadband, but it also provides uh, TV services, it's usually provisioned in the old days and still today a little bit, it's copper, now it's mostly fiber. Then we have the mobile wireless network. That is a network that you connect to uh, wirelessly using spectrum, radio spectrum, and we're talking about the radio spectrum in a minute. And then it feeds into a largely, you know, in, in, into a network that is very similar to the fixed line network. And then we have the satellite network. The satellite network has traditionally been used to broadcast um, TV content, but also to backhaul traffic. So traffic could come from mobile wireless, it could come from fixed line, and that is, is backhauled or brought from one destination to another 
via uh, via satellite. So we have three networks, fixed, mobile wireless, and satellite networks. So one thing I'm always harping on is like, you might think is why is this guy talking about mobile wireless? Is it sounds redundant? It isn't because there's this, there's this one annoying term and that's fixed wireless. Fixed wireless is a technology that you're using or on, on the fixed line side. And that simply means is that a household could connect via a dish on their house to, to a tower and that's still fixed service. You'll see that in, in more rural areas. So fixed wireless, um, fixed wireless is used for, for, uh, for fixed networks and could replace laying long cables in rural areas. Um, where the players, you have fixed line operators. Um, they are relevant to disputes. They, many of them in many countries were former monopolies, state owned at times, and they are still partially um, state owned in some places, um, but they're mostly being privatized. Um, but that's not everywhere the case. So you have the fixed line operators. You have the mobile wireless providers. They come in two flavors. You have the ones that are facilities based. They actually own um, infrastructure. Those are mobile network operators or MNOs. Then the second flavor is mobile virtual network operators. That's MVNOs. Those are ones that actually rent the infrastructure um, from, from MNOs. So if you think about, if, you, if you're familiar in the United States, we have Mint Wireless. Mint um, is an MVNO and, uh, and has wholesale agreements with the MNOs. Same thing is if you're looking at Comcast Xfinity or, or um, Spectrum, um, those are two companies that offer mobile wireless service, but uh, do not have facility. They are uh, MVNOs, so two different kinds. And then we have satellite uh, satellite providers. Again, sort of roughly two, two categories. One, we have the ge uh, geostationary satellites. Those are the ones that have been around for a very long time. They are used for various different purposes, including for, um, uh, for broadcasting TV and backhauling uh, internet traffic. Um, other reasons uh, they could be used for government purposes, for military reasons, and so forth. And most recently, and the ones that you've probably seen in the news more lately, are the low Earth orbiting satellite, the LEO satellites, and um, Elon Musk with SpaceX and Starlink um, is obviously the big one there. The LEO satellites they they fly much closer to Earth. There are many more of them. They're more dynamic, if you will, but they also need many more satellites and the satellites do not last as long as the geo satellites. A few days ago, Amazon Project Cooper um, launched uh, also satellites. So there is going to be excite, exciting movements on, on the satellite side. Um, so Laura, you ask about some of the key issues. Um, I mean, typically, so there, if we're thinking about it is the, the telecommunications sector is is regulated not everywhere the same not everybody is regulated the same so in the united states um fixed uh, fi fixed uh, line service is heavily regulated mobile wireless is less regulated satellite is somewhat regulated but not much and then in other countries you can have the reverse you can have like Canada, for instance, a lots, lots and lots of mobile wireless regulation. In other countries, you have a lot of, uh, of regulation. So regulation is a big topic in telecommunications, and that makes it so hard to work in it if you are in a dispute format, because every time the question comes up, well, what would the, what would the but for world have looked like? Well, you're not looking at a fully freely dynamic market. You're looking at a constrained market constrained by regulation. Regulation can be in the wholesale level. So for instance, we talked about MVNOs. In Canada, um, MVNOs are mandated by the Canadian government versus in the United States, they're not. They're all commercial agreements. So Mint has a commercial agreement, but in Canada, um, there's some regulation around it. And there are also some other countries around the world. In Europe, it's less regulated, although Europe, European Commission has used MVNOs as merger remedies in, in many of the different mergers that happen. 
Um, so regulation could be wholesale, it could be retail, and it just um, countries, governments, regulators are concerned that the, that there's not enough competition. And that is sort of bringing me to the next point is, in addition to regulation, what are key issues? Key issues are the problem that there's massive fixed costs in building a network. And so that, that means there, there's never going to be 20, 30 different mobile wireless operators in, in the space. I always say the golden rule is three. You can have four. Sometimes you have two. But that triggers competitive concerns. That triggers regulation. That triggers a lot of things. That triggers mobile wireless providers going out of business or selling themselves. If you were thinking about Sprint in the United States acquired by T-Mobile. A lot of that, the reason why the U.S. government finally uh, um, let that merger to go through is because there were just not enough um, space in the market for a fourth carrier. Now, you think about it, you have massive fixed costs. You need to have a certain market share in order to make sure that you have a positive business case. And usually a market really can't tolerate more than three, uh, three or four uh, providers. I mean, it depends a, a, across, but still, it is a big key issue is the high fixed costs. The high fixed costs um, lead to other issues, infrastructure sharing, where providers share infrastructure or more refined tower sharing, where towers are being shared. There's joint investments, there's foreign direct investments, and a lot of things that follow from the high fixed costs. So I would say just on the key issues, regulation, high fixed costs, and then maybe there's another additional aspect, and it's just um, the fact that we're relying so heavily as a society on telecommunications um, for our daily life, mobile wireless in particular. So governments are extremely concerned about that. They want to make sure that there's competition, that the services are provided, because they are tasked to protect the, uh, the public interest. So there's questions about taxing and telecommunication, um, profit sharing, concessions, all sorts of things that come up. But so that's roughly the key issues that I, I would uh, summarize. Thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned infrastructure and spectrum. I think infrastructure is a bit more tangible. We, we will not go further into it, but we want to talk a little bit more about spectrum because it might not be a term that is familiar for everyone. So Blanca, could you maybe give us an overview of how spectrum is distributed internationally and how countries transpose it then um, at the local level? Yeah, sure, Laura. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone here, Blanca Lorana from AT&T Mexico. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Chris mentioned two important things. One is that uh, there are certain services that need the spectrum to be provided. Those are the mobile and the satellite. And the second one is that in, main, in most jurisdictions it's considered a public service. There are conventions and they are even protected as a, at a constitutional level as human rights, the right to connect, the right to have broadband services, the right to have internet service. You cannot have that if you don't have the essential input that is the spectrum. Also another important thing to consider is that the spectrum is a scarce resource. So in that sense, you, you need to administer it and to allocate it efficiently. And that is why uh, the countries managed to do, a, do that at an international level of the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, which was born in the 1800s with the telegraph. And then it has switched uh, by the mean uh, 1900s uh, into part of the United Nations specialized uh, Unions. So what the countries do uh, nowadays, the ITU is formed by 193 countries. So most of the countries are there. And what they do is that they, they, they get consensus on what the use of the spectrum is going to be. You may have heard of bands. For example, we have low, mid and high bands. And each band is used for different types of services because otherwise there is going to be a mess and there is going to be interferences and services cannot be provided seamlessly. For example, if you live in Europe, you've experienced that when you're traveling from one country to another, you use the same terminal mobile to get connection. That is thank you to the ITU and the agreements that are reached by the countries. When you travel from continent to continent, more or less is the same. And that is why it is important, this type of agreements, because it allows manufacturers, companies such as AT&T, 
and other type of um, players in the in the telecom industry to reach a common ground and to be able to connect people uh, across the world. Right? Um, another important thing to consider from uh, about the spectrum is that uh, we have different allocations. For example, satellite services are normally provided in high bands and medium bands. Mobile is in low bands and medium bands. And this allows the different operators to provide the services without a need to be concerned about the interference or, the, or, the, or that the service can may be interrupted for customers. This, of course, has to be transposed at a local level. So most of the countries have a telecom regulations or telecom laws. And most of the countries have a regu regulators, like a regulatory bodies who are in charge of allocating the spectrum locally. So for example, in the US is the FCC, in London is the Ofcom, in Mexico is the IFT. And what they do is they also organize a spectrum auctions and they have all a, a license a regime where they can decide how they can allocate the spectrum. For example, uh, for uh, in Mexico, if you want to have a spectrum, you need to uh, participate in an auction bid if you're going to commercialize it. So if you're going to provide mobile services, you need uh, to you need the IFT to organize a bid and to have uh, to push and to have a spectrum allocated, you pay a fee for that and then you are able to deploy and all the infrastructure and all that. For example, satellite has a different regime. You can either have a you can either occupy an orbital position or you can have landing rights. So you can have a, a satellite located at an orbital position from another country, let's say, for example, Luxembourg. Luxembourg has a lot of satellites and it's quite interesting that because it's a very, very small jurisdiction. Um, Brazil also has a, an interesting regime with respect to satellite. So you launch your satellite and it normally has a flag like the ships, like the planes and all that, the satellites also have a flag because you have to launch a satellite with a jurisdiction because the ITU, what it does, it allocates orbital resources to the countries because as I said, everything that we're talking about is a scarce resource. It's finite. There is no unlimited spectrum. There is no limited uh, orbital positions. So we need to organize as a as a worldwide community in order to be able to have order and to be able to provide services and to allow people to connect. So uh, with respect, for example, to, to satellites, as I was mentioning, we have the orbital positions you have uh, in the orbital positions, as Chris was mentioning, we have different types of satellites. Those who go around the air, those who go faster, those who go even faster. And what they do is that they transpose each and they allow to have seamlessly con connection at all times. And that has to be organized at an international and local level. So, so for example, in the local level, there are countries who have open skies policy, where you don't need to have a license or a permit to download signals, for example, for, from a satellite. Chile has this kind of, a, of regime here in Mexico, we don't. We, you need to go to the IFT and to say, hey, I, I want to download the signal of this Brazilian satellite who goes in this band and all that. And they, what they do is that they verify that you can do it so they don't have interference and then they give you a permit. Uh, there are also different kinds of license regimes. There are concessions, Chris was uh, talking about it. There are permits, there are authorizations. And depending on the regime, you have more or less obligations. Uh, so with the spectrum, I think I th that covers most of the of how it's used and how it's played in international local level. Yes, thank you very much. Um, but could you maybe, because you're very familiar with Latin America, I think with the US as well and with Europe, could you maybe provide some examples of key um, decisions or key developments in those regions that have taken place recently? I yeah, that, that is very interesting because, for example, uh, all the international and local decisions evolve as technology evolves, right? I mean, as lawyers, we know that it's different to keep up the pace with, with evolution, but in the telecom sector, regulators and legis legislators must because otherwise you are left behind all the, all the digital and technology growth. 
Uh, so what has been done, for example, in the US, and you might have heard of it, is that there is a bank that is called the C-Bank that was historically used for satellite purposes. So um, what happened in the US is that they developed the technology so the C-Bank can be also used for mobile services. You may ask why, you know? why, why is it that uh, some banks can be used for one purpose or the other? And it's mainly related to engineering stuff, to the terminal. So for example, F uh, Chris was talking about fixed and mobile and satellite. Why is it fixed? Why is it mobile? And it's normally related to the terminal that we use to, to receive the service. For example, in the fixed, you have your phone at home and then it's fixed in one place. Mobile, this is our terminal. Even if you believe it or not, this is a, a terminal where we all receive the spectrum and then we are able to connect. So they, see, they developed the technology in order for the C-Bank to be used by all our terminal mobiles. So what the, and as I was mentioning uh, before, it is important, uh, regulators normally have the task to um, verify the efficient use of the spectrum. So what the FCC did in the US is that they put together the satellite operators, they reached an agreement, actually they were paid some sum in order to be able to move from one band to the other, because you have to migrate your traffic, you have to migrate whatever you're cursing on the spectrum, you have to move it. So they, they made a plan uh, in order to make a seamless movement organized, and they a vacate the C band in order for the mobile operators operators now to go and use it. So now, for example, this band that was historically used for satellites and is still used uh, for that for, for those purposes in other jurisdictions in the U.S. now belongs to mobile operators. In Mexico, for example, it took place something interesting um, in 2014. 15 more or less, uh, the, the regulator started to move the traffic from the television. Like what did, do you remember the antennas? If you are not that young, you might remember the antenna that you have to move in order to get the signal to the television. Those, uh, th that signal went also through the spectrum. So what they did is that they made a plan also to migrate this type of traffic in order to move it to another band in order to vacate it and to be used for mobile purposes. So what they did in here in Mexico, the government gave away TVs. They gave away televisions like new televisions, which uh, have the antennas incorporated in order for people to get rid of their old televisions and they could be able to still watch TV with the new technology and the new band. So they vacate the, the, this spectrum band, it was a 700. And then they put it for auction for a public um, program that is called the Red Compartida. I'm not going to bore you with that, but it, it was something that was also did by the Mexican government. And for example, in Germany, it's quite interesting because the government decided to allocate 100 megahertz. The megahertz are normally like the bandwidth that you have to play and to, to go to pass information. Uh, they decided to allocate uh, 100 megahertz for 5G uh, purposes. And what it's called in the industry, like five industry 4.0. What is industry 4.0? It's the, like in the industry standard that uses IoT, artificial intelligence and all that, and that need, needs to be connected mainly for industrial purposes. So those are three examples that I can give you, Laura how you can uh, regulators are, are playing with the spectrum. Yes, thank you very much. I think if if you're not yet teaching, you, you should you should try because you can explain it very illustratively. Um, and I think Hong also has experience in the sector and maybe to to have a more complete picture of the geographical developments. Hong, could you maybe tell us a little bit about Asia? Because we heard about Europe, about Latin America and the US. I don't know if there's anything in Asia that we should also be aware of. 
Um, I think it's worth highlighting Southeast Asia, which is a vibrant and high growth region that covers um, countries like Thailand, the Philippines, um, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And, and this is obviously generalizing, but in that region, there's a large and youthful population and also very high mobile penetration rates. So what that translates to is a rapidly developing digital economy, um, and we're likely to see continued, if not increased investments, um, I guess, on the mobile wireless front of, of the sector. The big players and investors tend to be companies from the region, uh, and there's some European presence, but there's also increased uh, investments from Chinese investors, not necessarily as the operators directly, but as infrastructure suppliers. So for instance, late last year, um, China Telecom joined a, a consortium of Southeast Asian telecom providers to invest into a new subsea cable system. Um, in terms of the regulatory framework, there's no unified one for Asia, um, but in recent years, in Southeast Asia at least, there is more focus on coordinating um, issues surrounding 5G rollout because the different um, countries are at different uh, stages of advancement in respect of that. Um, and on the more collaborative front, there is a spectrum management working group among the Southeast Asian states um, that's quite recently published in a report, multiple recommendations to the private and public sectors relating to the 5G deployment process. Thank you, very interesting. And just because I'm focusing mostly on, on space and space disputes, um, we are now moving from the introduction to the sector into disputes. And I just want to um, highlight as, as um, a transition, the fact that the increased use of spectrum, Blanca mentioned that it's a scarce resource. And because we see more and more satellites being launched, there's increased competition, not just between the satellite operators and the mobile, uh, the terrestrial operators, as Blanca mentioned, for the use of the spectrum. But we can also expect disputes to happen between satellite operators because they all use spectrum and there might be disputes in the near future with regard to interference between those operators both on the space side and with terrestrial operators. And I think now we can move into the dispute section and I will hand the microphone over to Hong. Thanks, Lara. Um, so the first question is directed at you, Chris. Um, can you tell us more about how the telecom services sector developed and also how that correlates to the frequency of disputes in different regions? Yeah, certainly. Um, so in, in terms of development, I think it comes no surprise at this point is if we're thinking back to our three networks, fixed mobile wireless and satellite, a lot of attention on mobile wireless these days. That's just because we're migrating to it. It's, it's, it's a term called convergence. Um, we already long recognized that mobile voice and fixed voice are substitutes, but now in the next uh, few years, it's already started. The question is whether um, we can actually replace the fixed line broadband connection at home with a, with a mobile wireless connection that comes in with 5G. And then in a few years from now, we'll be talking about uh, 6G. So this strong demand and traffic shift to mobile wireless, and that makes it very prone to disputes. Um, in terms of um, the satellites, satellite disputes are, are there, but I think they're going to come up more because there is, there are going to be very practical questions, especially on the LEO side. If you put so many satellites into space, well, who's gonna get the launch permit? Someone is gonna be upset if they don't get a launch permit and there's limited space up there. We're talking again, scarcity. What are you gonna do with traffic uh, um, management to avoid collisions? What are you gonna do with decommissioning to make sure that space debris burns out and doesn't hit up satellites? So if you think about back to our three networks, I would say they are, there's a trend over to wireless at this point, not to say the fix doesn't have any disputes, but wireless is really where it's at right now. And I do think a satellite is going to pick up more over the years because there's just some very big questions that need to be tackled. In terms of correlations to these issues, I think there's some each case is different. Each case has different allegations and so forth, but a lot of it is on the mobile wireless side. And it's um, not no, no surprise that these disputes center around the key issues that we talked about. There are regulatory disputes, uh, introduction of new regulation, changes to regulation. Well, you can't do that. I invested under this regime. Why are you changing it? You just destroy my entire business case. 
So, I mean, I should say they're typically, and you know this probably already, they're typically expropriation claims or, or claims of diminution in investment value, so more on the lost profit side. But those are the kind of things, lots and lots of ex expropriation claims. So for instance, you changed your regulation, now my business case is negative, or now you've given somebody else unfair advantage. So regulation draws a lot of, of disputes. Uh, government changes, of course, and I think that's probably not unique to telecommunications when governments change. Uh, there, that can impact the business case. Somebody might even have to leave the country uh, or at least cannot operate it as freely as they could before. So that triggers uh, disputes. Then, so those are sort of regulatory disputes. There are many of them. There are scarcity disputes. That is how spectrum allocated, how's radio spectrum allocated? How do you allocate um, a satellite spectrum? Who gets to use the satellite uh, spectrum? What about if you consider a lot of new nations that have very limited internet bandwidth. So these backbones, Hong mentioned submarine cables, and you know you 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 bring in internet bandwidth into a country. Well, who's going to get to use that? If you have let's say three fixed line operators and one is a foreign investor, how do you allocate that? I, I was involved in an entire dispute about that. What's a fair allocation um, that goes all to the fair treatment clause in the bilateral investment treaties? So those are scarcity disputes. We have licensing disputes. What do you do if 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 a if if an entity is not using the license or is going bankrupt or delaying it? That's quite similar to mining cases where you have exploration and exploitation permits and they're not using it. What are you doing if you have, that's exactly fundamentally the same question. What are you doing if you have a spectrum license also scarce resource also belongs to the nation? What do you do then? Should it revert back to the state or should it get into uh, liquidation? Should it, uh, should it be a part of a bankruptcy proceeding? So licensing dis disputes. Various other ones, uh, profit sharing disputes um, are, you know, should the government get a share that, you know, that leads in the same thing as taxing disputes, asset reversion disputes. What do you do at the end of a concession? Who owns the assets that were that were built? Um, and so that's on the on the state investor side. A lot of expropriation, lost profit claims, mostly expropriation claims. Um, on the commercial side, it's harder to really um, say that there's a strong correlation because we just don't observe them all. There's many ones that are behind those closed doors, and if we're not involved, we can't really observe them. But most of the ones that I've observed are the ones that deal with just business partners. And that goes back to the high fixed cost. Um, so you can have a, a, a local and a foreign investor, you fo form a joint venture and something goes wrong. So the two types I see is, is partnerships that go sour, they file commercial uh, litigation on that, or they could be um, some sort of breach in, in supply contract. Say you need a network equipment, you, you're not getting it on time, and then you're asking for lost profit. So those are those are the general disputes. And I know Hong, you mentioned, you know, where are they happening? Um, I think sort of again, roughly, um uh, Latin America has a has a lot of disputes in the telecommunications sector. Interesting enough, they all um, not all, many of them do uh, center around the asset reversion. Uh, it seems to be a very popular topic whenever see asset reversion. I think what must be must be Latin America, but it's also got infrastructure sharing, tower sharing. There's there are other aspects in Latin America, and that's just because that sector has been, or that continent rather has been, um, regulated for quite some time, and so asset reversion concession agreements and things like that are things that coming to an end. And the question is, what do you do then? And that causes disputes. Um, we're finding a lot of um, issues in Eastern Europe, uh, Central Asia, so former UDSSR or U former Yugoslavian countries, a lot of disputes are happening there on things like internet bandwidth and uh, preferential treatment because the infrastructure is just still new. And they are, there's not, you know, a, an un, you know, a, a, there's an insufficient amount of capacity going through those countries. So there's automatically uh, disputes. Um, we're seeing some uh, disputes in, in, in Asia. 
Um, Hong mentioned a, a few of them. There could be uh, changing governments. We've seen those. There could be just expropriation claims in terms of a change of regulatory conditions because Asia is very active. It's a very active um, market and there's a lot of changes in market dynamics and in regulation. Africa, we see some of the disputes, but haven't really seen that many of them, but, but that's just from my observation. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, another area of disputes we wanted to touch upon um, is those between states and investors, which Chris has also touched on um, for a bit earlier. Uh, and to kick things off, I'll make a few observations on the trends um, in terms of the disputes. So broadly speaking, disputes in this space tend to fall into three groups, we would say. Um, the first are disputes that arise from states regulating or sometimes asserting greater control over a particular sector through the, re the revocation of licenses um, for failure to comply with local laws or sometimes non-renewal of operating contracts for various reasons, including what is sometimes alleged to be uh, resource nationalism, which can engage discrimination or legitimate expectation type claims. Um, and I would add that, for instance, non-renewal was at issue in an award this year where Turkmenistan prevailed against a Russian investor, um, and that's where Chris was also uh, the industry expert. Um, and there's also a second group of disputes in this area, which is those that arise from political unrest or regime changes that Chris also mentioned earlier. Um, and here I will highlight that telecom infrastructure is usually critical, and because it can be used to intercept communications, that's seen as a very important um, aspect in, in any sort of regime change uh, that, that happens. So for instance, in the Myanmar military coup in 2021, telecom providers were actually ordered to install intercept spyware in the lead up to those events, which, which really shows the importance of control over such assets. And these types of uh, scenarios have given rise to investor state disputes as well. Um, one of the more recent examples being by a BVI company against Kyrgyzstan and also a case brought by Al Jazeera against Egypt. And I'll let Laura tell us more about the third group. Yes, so the, th the third one is relating to national security concerns, um, which sometimes authorities change their positions towards a specific operator or towards equipment um, on the basis of national security concerns. Um, and this can also give rise to disputes, as we have seen um, in, in important cases over the last years. For example, the Davis versus India saga, where the enforcement of the award keeps um, being in the press. Um, in this case, India cancelled a lease contract for the use of S-band spectrum for alleged security reasons, which was partly upheld by, by the tribunal. And we can also refer to the proceedings um, that Huawei initiated against Sweden over the exclusion of Huawei from the rollout of 5G network technology over national security concerns. And Huawei has also threatened to bring similar claims against other countries such as the Czech Republic or the UK um, that have raised similar security concerns over the presence of Huawei technology in, in their countries. So we can see that, um, especially with the, within the current geopolitical environment, um, that there can be concerns over te telecom technology that can also give rise to disputes in the ISDS sphere. Thank you, Hong. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, so now turning more to the commercial disputes aspect that, that arises between private entities in this sector, um, Blanca, can you tell us more about the nature of these disputes that you've observed um, and whether these are being resolved by say arbitration or is it more common for these to go through the local court process? Yeah, sure, Con, thank you. As you may have already noticed, uh, the telecom industry is quite a complex one, and it's an ecosystem that is inhabited by states and companies and international bodies, but we also have an important participation of private parties. So we, are, we have the operators, the, the companies that are providing the services, but in order to provide the services, you have different inputs. One of those is the spectrum, we already discussed it, but we also need the infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure can be optic fiber, can be towers, can be antennas, uh, can be, for example, the devices that we need to receive the spectrum signals. So you have different uh, uh, agents participating on that. And 
for each of the distribution chains, we need to enter into contracts, right? I mean, we are, we, we are lawyers. We know that everything is governed by contracts and that our law, our life is mainly mandated by contracts that are negotiated behind. So uh, we have contracts, for example, with uh, tower providers, with devices providers. We have contracts with Apple, Samsung, uh, with Ericsson, Huawei, uh, Nokia for the equipment that are in the towers, uh, with tower companies, with fiber deployment companies and all that. And uh, as you already seen, the brands are kind of the same across jurisdictions. So most of them are international companies. So uh, most of the agreements or the commercial agreements are governed uh, by arbitration clauses. Why? Because companies in general feel more um, uh, acquainted with that kind of process. And sometimes you can, uh, you, you also have the flexibility to decide, you know, we, where do, do you want the arbitration, which language, how do you want the arbitration tri tribunal to be composed? And even though we, we have heard about regulation, law, and all that, uh, the public service is what is regulated at, at the local or at an international level, but the commercial relationships, uh, in those relationships, normally the state does not intervene. So you have the flexibility to agree on different uh, jurisdiction clauses. Now that, that, that's one of the, of the points that you were touching. Also, it is important to understand that we have different types of relations. We have the vertical relations, and the horizontal ones. So in the horizontal are the ones I already discussed with the providers and what we need to provide a service. But in the horizontal ones, we also need to have agreements between operators. Why? Because there are different networks. For example, you have in the US, you have T-Mobile, you have AT&T, and you have to be able to make a call from one to the other. Uh, in Mexico, we have also different operators and you need to have certain things that are regulated, such as interconnection, for example, interconnection here in Mexico is considered um, a matter of public order in different countries as well, because you need to be able to change from one network to the other in order to, to give a seamless service. Um, you also have roaming. If you've been from country to country, you have experienced international roaming here, but you also have local roaming. The local roaming also refers to coverage. For example, you cannot, uh, Chris was talking about the heavy costs that represent to deploy a network. So you need, uh, if you have already an operator who has deployed certain infrastructure in certain parts of the country that are difficult to reach, you normally enter this type of agreements, roaming agreements with the other operator in order for him to give you coverage in that area and you can also serve your clients. Uh, we also have distribution agreements. Uh, Chris was also speaking about two kind of operators that we have in the mobile sector. We have the MNOs that are the full mobile operators. We have a spectrum, we have a the towers, uh, we have all of that. And then you have the MBNOs that more and more you're hearing from. The MBNOs are, they have a different business model. Normally they target a specific part of the population or a specific part where they can see that they provide value and they don't have a spectrum allocated. They normally don't have these expensive costs because they enter into commercialization agreements or wholesale agreements with the big operators in order to be able to receive the service, but with a different brand. So they have a different branding, they have a different target. They may have, for example, only data packages, uh, data related to, to be used in a community and all that. So you, you have different uh, business schemes and as business schemes change, then you have different types of contracts. These contracts, for example, they can be resolved at local courts because they normally refer to local leg legislation or local regulation. No, for also a contract related to real estate are normally locally resolved. They may also have arbitration clause, but they deal with a local dispute. So you may have arbitration, but is desired to have a local jurisdiction or to be a related to local laws because it's normally related to rights that are inherited or are directly um, 
related to the country that where you are operating. Uh, and it, it is also important uh, if you are, for example, on the side where you are provided to, re to review or, or to, um, or to decide on which type of clause you're going to use for a certain contract to, to understand what is the right that you're protecting, right? I mean, in if you have something related to rights of use or rights of deployment or something related to local regulation, then it might be desired to have local laws. And maybe you can have the flexibility to decide on arbitration or to local tribunals, depending on the jurisdiction. But uh, it is important to understand what are you dealing with? Is it a right protected by civil commercial law? Is it a right that it's uh, mandated in a, a telecom regulation? And then from there you can construct, you know, I've seen different types of clauses with Laura, we've seen crazy ones related where you can have to appoint arbitrators who have a knowledge in infrastructure or something like that. Uh, so you have to be able to, to understand what you are uh, looking at, and then the sky is the limit. I mean, you, you can have different types of clauses agreed upon between the parties. Thanks very much for that, Blanca. And just a quick follow-up um, from the point you touched on earlier. Um, do you see that there's a need uh, for arbitrators and decision makers with more specialized knowledge on this sector? Um, and do you have any observations or thoughts perhaps on how any sort of perceived gap in knowledge might be rem remedied? Yeah, I mean, the telecom industry, it's very uh, particular. I mean, you have to understand that you already seen like a lot of technical technicalities, a lot of technical things, uh, but it, I think it depends on the subject matter that you are going to resolve. For example, we've seen that uh, in the end, if you have a dispute between a telecom operator and a, and a device provider, it's a commercial one, no? And it might be related with royalties, with distribution, with breaches of contract. So it might be more a civil and commercial one, not a telecom. You might need to provide the background to the arbitral tribunal or to the judge, but for that you have experts. So you can have an expert on that. But with respect to regulators or to specialized courts that we are seeing more and more in different jurisdictions, then yes, you need to have a telecom background and preferentially also an antitrust one because uh, Laura and Chris touched upon uh, competition matters. I mean, it's a very close sector. It, there are few participants because of the cost, it's difficult to enter, you need a lot of inputs, you need to also have the expertise to develop a network into operator. So we see, for example, in Europe, you normally see the regular bands, no? Orange, Movistar, and all that across countries. In America, it happens the same or less with Claro, that is in Mexico, Telcel, AT&T, that we have presence in Mexico and in, and in the... Um, so you have a, a di different uh, participants and also has bears the importance of being a public service. So. If there is a regulator or there's a specialist course, yes, then yes, it's desirable to have a telecom background, preferably accompanied with an antitrust one because of the different uh, uh, issues that arise in, in the common days of the market. Thanks very much, Blanca. Um, and perhaps one final question for you, Chris. Uh, what are some of the more sector-specific questions that are posed to industry experts when you see um, these telecommunication disputes? So just uh, Blanca raised uh, a number of good points is the question to the experts is typically it starts what is economic harm or please review a claim of economic harm. But it, it's really hard to just look at that in isolation without understanding the sector. So I'll give you an example is we're working on a case where the question was the that the particular foreign investor did not receive enough capacity on the fixed line side. So its traffic was not backhauled back hauled as efficiently as others in the country. And that led to more dropped calls um, than other operators. So what they did then is they said, well, since our service got handicapped 
we could not sell our services at the price we wanted and we lost market share. So that goes back into, into what Blanca said about antitrust. What about the competitive dynamics? So if I'm asked as, a, as, a, as an expert, it's like, well, what is economic harm? I have to start with where typically liability is. I have to find out whether they really have more dropped calls. How else can I do my work? And for that, you need to know where that is housed. That's in the call detail record in the CDRs. And you look at it. So what do you do if, from an expert perspective, what do you do when you find that there's in fact no evidence of more dropped calls on the claimant side relative to other providers? Well, you can continue with your work. So the questions to the post to the experts is often a combination of damages and liability on top of each other. Sometimes the results that you, uh, that clients retain only one person. In other cases, I've been in. You can bifurcate damages and liability beautifully, and there's no, you know, you can have two people. But here in the telecommunication sector, is if you want to quantify properly, you need to have that background on the technical side. You need to know where it's located. You need to have the any antitrust background, you need to know that this market is not freely operating, it's regulated. It all goes in into one big, big uh, assignment. And so often what ends up on my cases is, is, at least on the telecom side, I will opine on damages, but also ask to opine on particular pieces um, that pertain more to liabilities. The questions are the traditional ones, though. Um, it's just like in any other case, what will be the market fair market value of the business case or or an expropriated asset? What would competition have been but for the allegations? Uh, what profits would have claimed and attained? Uh, were the regulatory changes in line with international best practice? That's more a, a, a liability question. The next one is also more liability questions. Was there economic justification for the regulatory change? And then maybe more on the commercial side, you know, what's the lost profit um, uh, set up? What, what's the value of the joint venture? Um, that could also be, um, we talked about spectrum a lot, the question about what, what's, what's the value of spectrum? And that's a really interesting one because the, the fair market value increased significantly, but often you can't sell it, it's not yours. Right, and so it raises a whole lot of of, uh, of of different questions. So that's what it is. I I always say if you do want to do damages in telecommunications, you need to come in with a very strong background. That's not always necessary in international arbitration, but here you need the institutional background, and that leads the expert to almost unavoidably opine on some of the liability issues as well. Thank you very much, Chris. That was really helpful. And I think with the time left, we probably might have time for some questions. Um, so perhaps over to you, Laura. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the Q&A function, but I, but I do have a question to maybe um, finalize the webinar, which is how do you, or where do you see the industry going forward? We have seen that there has been a movement away from fixed to mobile services and also um, a movement away from geostationary satellites towards the lower Earth orbits. Um, but where do you think those developments will lead? And what role do you think satellite operators will have in the coming years? For well, both. Take a first stab at it. Um, I definitely think we, we're going to see more mobile wireless uh, disputes. Um, but as I hinted on earlier, I do think we need to watch the space because there are these important questions. I'm frankly surprised there hasn't been any litigation yet. I've spoken to a number of attorneys, including you, Laura, on this topic. Is like I I think there were a few, I mean, I'm aware of a few disputes, um, but they have been resolved. Um, but I do think there's going to be very big questions on if one country wants to launch 3,000 satellites into LEO space, and then and then SpaceX says, well, we're already there, or whoever makes the decision says, well, there's not enough space, or we need to change regulation, you need to do different traffic management tools or, or, or uh, uh, collision avoidance uh, tools. I just wonder how that's going to all shape up. So I would say 
today, mobile wireless, tomorrow, um, satellite is probably going in, in, in this entire game as well. Thank you. Blanca, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I agree with Chris. I mean, I think more and more we're seeing the need to be connected, the use of telecommunications uh, in the industry, in our daily lives. And if you see also public policy is normally related to that. So we are seeing governments who are uh, going more and more to open markets, to free the markets. And then we see other governments who are more uh, trying to get back, you know, like to control telecommunications, to control the industry. So we are going to see, I think, a lot of changes in different parts of the, of the world, uh, different trends. And it's going to be seen if they change a lot of regulation or not. Uh, with respect to the space in particular, I think we're going to be a lot of uh, disputes even between states about uh, allocation of responsibility. You know, who is responsible for or the um, uh, how many satellites are going to Earth? What are we doing with the debris that is in the space? What are we doing with the interferences? A military a use of telecommunication, national security. We are seeing more and more this trend also with uh, countries that are allocating spectrum for military use, for public use. So I think this is going to be a trend uh, that needs to be watched closely. And I think we are going to have more and more disputes related to telecom and space regulations, yes. So maybe we will have interesting topics for future webinars in our hope and what is hopefully becoming a series. So thank you very much um, for joining us today. It was very interesting. I learned a lot. I hope the, the audience as well. And I wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you for the invite. Have Thanks a good day. Everyone.